tonight we um, just make sure I'm still in business here. Okay, good. <clears throat> We're going to do a little sort of a quick review as we get into. <clears throat> um, we're sort of moving into that, that phase, and I'm trying to think of the um, handout that I told you guys to hang on to, the Discovering God's Truth, <clears throat> uh, the, the six steps. <clears throat> um, so what we're going to be Focusing on tonight is steps three and four, but we're just going to do a quick review, if you will, of, uh, of steps one and two, <clears throat> and then next week we will um, do five and six, and then the final week we're going to uh, talk about tools and, and study um, resources and things like that. <clears throat> so, so we're going to be talking, we've been talking about what the Bible says and trying to understand what the Bible says. So tonight we're going to try to get into understanding what the Bible means and really, and this, this is where it, it takes time. Um, and again, sort of backing up, we look at, we look at the interpretive process. Okay, that we have covered some of, and we're just going to summarize it here. <clears throat> um, as I was saying, don't we can't be in a hurry. You know, it's it's important not to just read something in the scripture and think that we know what it says, and that we know what it means, and that we understand its application <clears throat> because we've heard it a million times, or because it seems clear that it, you know. Um, we take our time, we look at it, we consider it. <clears throat> um, there's no such thing as an instant understanding of Scripture. Uh, scholars have spent their lives studying the Scriptures, trying to <clears throat> unlock the, the, the understanding of, of some, some of the Scriptures. Uh, and we have the benefit of their, of their study. And that's some of the stuff that we're going to talk about in the last class is the resources that we have available to us to be able to, to get into the depths of, of understanding scriptures. <clears throat> um, immerse yourself in the scripture. Uh, just like the, you know, what I said on the, in the first class when I gave the assignment about reading that passage, Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. Read it multiple times. Read it 20 times. Read it 30 times. <clears throat> um, that's one of those things that Chuck Smith said he always did. Before he preached on a passage, he would read it, just read it, not even trying to understand it, not even trying to um, dig deep into it, but just he would just read it 30 times just so that the, the, the rhythm and the pace of it and the voice of it um, <clears throat> get got in his head. And I'll tell you, it's from... From a pastoral perspective, <clears throat> it um, it's helpful to the hearers when the one teaching the scripture has become so familiar with it. And this is one of the things that that <clears throat> one of the first things that drew me about Bill. If you ever notice, particularly on Wednesday nights, because sometimes he's reading a lot of scripture, he's going through multiple chapters, and <clears throat> but he has read through them so many times that he's got the rhythm, you know? Sometimes when you're reading and, you know, we've been in groups, whether ladies' groups or men's group or home fellowship, where <clears throat> we each take a turn reading a verse, you know, and we're going through. And if we're not super familiar with the verse, we're, sometimes we're sort of stumbling with the, the rhythm of it and the sound of it and the voice of it. <clears throat> but when you have read it, just, re just read it that many times, you... Uh, you sort of get the voice behind it. And so that now when you're reading it out loud, we have the benefit of, of hearing it read in, in the way that most closely resembles the way that it should sound. And it's helpful to us. You know, it's almost like that, that example I gave in, the, in the, I think in the first class about, you know, whether I say, are we going to eat grandma or are we going to eat grandma? <laughs> 
right? You know, the, the intonation and the way we read things is very important to, to helping us understand it. <clears throat> and that's why just immersing ourselves in it, reading it over and over and over again. And because <clears throat> sometimes we read it and then we go, no, that didn't sound right. That just sounded weird the, the way that I read that. So I'm going to read it again. And you sort of get the rhythm of it. <clears throat> so immerse yourself in it. Treat it like a love letter, which is what it is. You know, somebody writes you a note um, expressing how they feel about you. you. You read it multiple times. You take time enjoying it, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Well, you should. I never had one. <laughs> no, you never had one written to you, Jerry? Okay. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> um, and then uh, approach the passage like a reporter, asking questions. Who, what, when, where, and why? Who, who who's writing it? Who's the audience? Who's it about? Uh, what, what is the literary form? What's the topic? What's the subject matter? Okay, when is it taking place? Uh, where is it taking place? Uh, where is he going? Where is... Uh, where is he taking us? Why was it written? Okay, again, this, this is all sort of getting into context, which we talked about in class two. <clears throat> Why was it written? Is he angry? Whoever the, the human author, because the, the, the occasion for the writing is very important to the meaning of the writing, and the occasion of the human author is important because God used that occasion to, to deliver this, to deliver the word, in the human author's voice and tone. And so, you know, what's, you, you know, you read 1 Corinthians and Paul's not happy. You know, he's not, it's, it's, it's not, you know, we're reading 1 John, right? <clears throat> and 1 John 2 last week. John's, John is, he's, he's instructing them, but in the midst of instructing them, he goes, he's like, you guys are amazing. You're not like this at all. You guys have it down. You guys are mature, but, you know, we should. And he's like building them up. And in, in 1 Corinthians, Paul's not like that at all. He's like, I'm, you know, he's basically saying, I'm ashamed of you guys. You guys, you guys didn't listen to me. You guys, what, I spent all that time with you and you didn't, <clears throat> and you've, you've fallen back into the world. You've, you've made excuses for sin. It, you know, he's, I don't, I don't necessarily want to say he was angry, but he was certainly disappointed. And, and that tone in his voice is very important to, to understanding the, the context, you know? So why did, did the human author write this book? Because that will give us insight as to why God wanted to include it in the canon. <clears throat> um, how? Um, that how, is, how, does, how is it that they're presenting the subject? How, how does this affect my life? How does it relate to today? All right. So, you know, think of that when we're reading the scriptures, you know, like a reporter, who, what, when, where, and why, and how, right? <clears throat> um, consider word meanings. And we got into this in class three. Come on. All right. It's very, it's vital to arrive at the clear meaning of each of the words. You know, we're trying to get at the mind behind the words. You know, God's mind and, and the meaning behind it <clears throat> and not let there be a misunderstanding. So often just disagreements in general, whether it's with a family member, a loved one, a friend or even a stranger. It's nine times out of ten is a misunderstanding. You know, what was meant to be conveyed was not received in the manner that it was transmitted you know, and, and, and somehow it came off wrong. And, and so it was, it was received wrong. So we want to make sure we get at the, the mind behind the words and not just, uh, just settle on what the words are. I won't, we've already talked, I think, ad nauseum about original language. We had a whole class on that. <clears throat> um, but another useful tool that's often um, neglected is an English dictionary. And I think, was it here? Was it last week we were talking about, somebody was talking about 1828. I think it was, a, it's a website, but it's, it's, it's the, the Webster dictionary, you know, get, have a good dictionary, whether it's online or, you know, American heritage or, or Merriam Webster, 
I've, all, <clears throat> I've always enjoyed uh, word study, and I bought a uh, Bible dictionary. Okay. And uh, it doesn't have all the words like a, you know, like a Webster's or nothing like that. Yeah. But it has about everything that's in the Bible. And yeah. It gives that, you the kind of a, the kind of a meaning that you're looking for if you're reading the Bible, and you look up a word like if you were looking for <clears throat> sermon notes. Do you know the name of the? Uh, do you remember the no, name? Of it? I can get it for next week. Is it? Is it? Is does it say Bible dictionary on it? Yeah. Okay. Because yeah, it? typically a Bible dic and this is where this is just one of the terms that we have to learn and why they do this, I don't know, but a Bible dictionary is really more like an encyclopedia. Yeah, it is. Right? It's 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 not it's not a dictionary in the word in the sense that we think like giving word meanings it gives information yeah. let's sometimes and it, it's a great tool it's a great it's a very useful tool i would in, encourage everybody to to get a bible dictionary but a bible dictionary is sort of like an encyclopedia of terms in the bible a a dictionary in in the sense that we understand is what's called a lexicon for the bible a lexicon will have um, um, a, a list of words, and then it'll have the original language, and then it'll have the meaning and some etymology in there and that kind of stuff like you would see in a Webster dictionary, and it's called a lexicon. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes, sometimes you may see it as um, what's called a word study or an expository dictionary but most of the time it's called a lexicon. If you see something that's called a Bible dictionary, it's a great tool. It's just, it's more of an encyclopedia than an actual dictionary. <clears throat> um, but a good English dictionary is good because, you know, the, those that, that translated the Bible into English uh, were pretty painstaking and they chose the word that they chose for a reason. And I think it, it you know, obviously the, the original language is is vital, um, but I think it's important if we look at the English word and and maybe discover why the translator chose that English word to put in there. And again, the <clears throat> that is for those Bibles that are literal, that are word for word Bibles, like the King James, the New King James, the New American Standard. Um, I think the, um, I keep wanting to call it Holman, but it's made by Holman, the Christian, Christian Standard Bible, something, it's a new one that just came out, but it's a more of a, of a, a word for word. Uh, the ones that are thought for thought, like the NIV and the, the new, um, um, the New Living Translation, they're fine for reading, but don't don't put a lot of emphasis on the words on the actual words that are in there because that wasn't the focus in the translation. The focus was was trying to express the thought. <clears throat> um, but a good English dictionary is 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 good. And then get a lexicon or or something that um, uh, an expository dictionary. Vines is is a is a real simple one. You know, a lot of times lexicons they look like a dictionary. They're just 10,000 words, you know, yes. uh, if you've ever seen like the back of a strong concordance, you know, uh, Vines is a little bit more forgiving, a little more user friendly. Uh, it doesn't have as many words in it, but it tries to focus on the, uh, the most um, popular words and, and give, giving definitions to words. <clears throat> um, but, you know, be a detective. Don't take anything for granted and, and just and look into things. Be, be vigilant when we're when we're studying the Bible. Um, if you feel like it's you haven't gotten there yet, then don't give up. Just keep keep looking and keep trying to um, find things. And 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 um, you know, if 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 looking into the grammar isn't enough, then that's when it's we can go to commentaries. Commentaries for me is always the last place I look. I want to get in my mind what I've discovered before I go and look at what somebody else has discovered. Now, looking at what somebody else has discovered is fine, and I use commentaries all the time. They're, sometimes they're very, very helpful. 
but I like for them to be either confirm or maybe even refute what I have found, you know, rather than being the source of information. So um, uh, ask interpretive questions and think through to conclusions. Where are we? Right? Again, be a detective. Um, it's okay if you read something and, and you're like, and, and, and you have questions, it doesn't mean you lack faith. It doesn't mean if you're like, uh, it may be that what you always assumed the Bible said about something was wrong. That, you know, and I think, I can't remember if I used this example, but you know, the, that whole issue about eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. <clears throat> Turning the other cheek and people always assume that eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth meant, well, if somebody takes out your eye, you take out their eye. Somebody takes out your tooth, you take out their tooth. Everything, you, you're allowed to do as much damage to them as they do to you. <clears throat> the reality is, it was a restriction. If they take out your eye, you only take out their eye. You don't cut their head off. It was a, it was a limitation on, on, you know, so... Sometimes we hear things over and over and we assume we know what they mean, but be vigilant, be a detective, keep digging. Some of these translations, like the King James, they had a bunch of people putting it together. Mm -hmm. Like the New King James, do they base it on the Old King James or do they base it on the Greek? And Both. The New King James is, <clears throat> is a, they've gone back to the original languages to, to try to be more accurate um, and to update the language, but try to um, replicate, if you will, sort of the rhythm and the sound of the King James, because so many people are so familiar with the King James. <clears throat> but sometimes you get hung up on the antiquated language. So the purpose of the new King James was to sort of update the language and make it, make it sound more up to date. But going back, in doing that, going back to the original languages so that they could update the language better. So that's, that one is, it's somewhere between a translation and a revision. So. <clears throat> it seems kind of like it uh, maintains the poetic, you know, I, I have a hard time understanding the old King James. But the new King James has, that still has that poetic yeah, it has the same rhythm. It, yeah. it sounds like it's saying the same thing. It just minus the, the, the hithers and the thithers and the thous and the, yeah. you know. So that's why I like it. <clears throat> um, but like another, I think, I think I might have brought this up in the home fellowship, not here. Um, <clears throat> but like a verse that always puzzled me was Jesus was talking to the disciples about the, about the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and he said, you know, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. You know, of sin because they do not believe, of righteousness because I go to be with my Father. I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> of righteousness because I go to be with my Father. And I used to scratch my head. What does him going to be with his Father have to do with the Holy Spirit convicting people of righteousness? And, you know, and that's one of those things where I got to look into that. I want, you know, that it just bugged me that I couldn't understand the relation. And I, and I had to start digging and digging and digging. And ultimately, I discovered that. And it just once I heard, it, I went, oh, of course, that makes sense. It's, that's, it's so simple is he's telling his disciples, look, I'm not going to be here to tell you what's right and wrong anymore. I'm going to be with my father. I'm not here to convict you of righteousness because that's what his, that's what he did. He was letting them know what's right, what's wrong. He was letting them know what righteousness was. He says, but I go to be with my father. So I'm sending the Holy Spirit and he will convict you of righteousness because I go to be with my father. Right. And it takes a little digging. And sometimes you'll come across verses like that where it's not obvious what he's taught, what, what it's talking about. But with a little bit of digging, you can, you can get there. Good. Mm-hmm. One of the things that uh, really has really struck me with this class is the misconception of what I have about something that was said, like the one the deal at the first miracle when he called his mom woman. Sure. You know, 
how do you know when you're reading through that that you go, wow, that's <clears throat> If I'd have said that to my mom, she'd have knocked my face off. Yeah. <laughs> you know, really. And yeah. I'm thinking he was being a little ornery, but, you know, here we're talking about Jesus. How do you know? I mean, how well, do you, where do you find out that but, that's not the way it was? Right. And that's, and that's where you, um, you, you look into other resources and like we're going to talk about in the last class, I'm going to show you some of the resources, oh. you know, and, <clears throat> you know, that's the kind of thing where, where you have to find out a little bit about the culture. Uh, and again, fortunately there have, there are people who have done that. And that's the kind of information you find out in commentaries. You're not going to find that out in a lexicon or, you know, in, in studying original languages and things like that. That's, you're going to find that kind of stuff in commentaries because they've done some, some cultural background, studying. Um, the one source that is uh, the most comprehensive source for that is something that's called um, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah yeah, by know. Alfred Edersheim, you know, yeah. and he he talks a lot about the the world back then, what it was like and, and the culture and the customs. And and they will focus on, you know, particular passages in the Bible and say, this is why this is put this way and this is what it's talking about. And so, again, it's it's resources, you know, and it takes it. And that's why, you know, it takes a little digging. It takes a little little detective work. Um, you know, you don't. If you went through life thinking that it, it wouldn't necessarily destroy your concept of Jesus or. Or, or of the word of God, it, it would just be a, a head scratcher, you know? And, and if, that, if that's the case, that's the case. It, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't devastate you, but um, my point being that, look, you don't, you don't have to have all these resources in order to be able to appreciate the scriptures. <clears throat> you can appreciate them a whole lot more if you're willing to do a little bit of digging and a little bit of research because of the gap, because it's a cultural gap, it's a language gap, it's a geographical gap. You know, there's, there's things that are said in ways, you know, that, that just can't be properly translated. And so we do have to do a little more digging than you might if something was written in your native language and in your native culture. So, it, it, you know, we can get what we need to get to um, to get saved and to appreciate the word of God, but to, to gain a greater appreciation, um, I would recommend getting at least some, just some simple resources. Uh, and again, we'll talk about that in the last class, but especially today, because there's all kinds of things online that, that you can make, that you can avail yourself of. Can I just ask a question? Sure. Is distance and time in the Middle East altered not necessarily because the because the because the, the language has changed you know you know first of all they don't they don't they speak arabic now in the middle east they don't speak greek and that was the bible was written in greek <clears throat> um you know we may we may be able to pick some things up from um from the culture because some things, and Bill was talking about that on Wednesday night. He was talking about the Bedouins and, and how Jeremiah was, uh, um, was referring to the Bedouins. And I think it was, had something to do with the, um, what were they doing? They were, they were trying to get ready to fight, to fight against um, Nebuchadnezzar. And there were certain things that the king was doing and, and trying to enlist the Bedouins or something. And, um, and then he was talking about how when he went to, when um, you guys went to Israel and saw the Bedouins and how there's a lot of things that are very similar, you know, how they still, how they had built them nice houses and they put the animals in the houses and then they lived in tents, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and that's just, their, that's just their culture. So some things you can probably pick up. That's why going to Israel can be a great experience to go there and see the culture and see the, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, it's been 2,000 years, so there's been a lot of change, especially in the language. You know, even Greek is not the same as it was. You know, I mean, we, we can go back just a couple of hundred years, and English is not the same. 
You know, we go back 400 years to when the King James, and actually the King James that we have in front of us now is not the King James that was written in 1611. Mm -hmm. You get a 1611 King James and it's thick as mud, man. I mean, it's, it's tough reading uh, because the English language has just changed so much. Um, it was um, Tracy, Tracy got me a Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible was the predecessor to the King James and it is written in English. I can't understand a word of it. <laughs> Even the letters are almost unintelligible. It's, 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 really, it's really difficult. And that's just in four or 500 years how English has changed. So language-wise, things have really changed. But culturally, you could probably pick up some things from, from the modern Middle East, you know, understanding their... I, mean, uh, I have a topical Bible from 1869. Really? And it's different. Wow. Even that... That's relatively recent. I mean, yeah, sure. It's, it's amazing. I didn't even know they would have done a topical Bible back then. Well, this guy has only met Roland for two years, and uh, it's it, it's like you look up love, and what he did was he just put all every scripture in there. That Is it Knaves? Huh? Is it Knaves? No, it's okay. a real old book. I bought it okay. in a flea market for ten bucks. Oh, cool. And uh, yeah, it's it's really something. The whole front of the Bible. Is uh, marriages and deaths of the, yeah. of the Meeks family in oh, wow. South Carolina or something. Oh, wow. yeah. yeah, I know Nave's topical Bible. That's kind of the, the standard for topical Bibles, and it does the same thing. It'll have topics, and then it'll give all the verses, sort of in that on that issue. Um, yeah, well, this guy was like a door-to-door -door salesman. He got he wrote this, had it printed, and sold it. Yeah, hmm. kind of a weird deal, but it's really a cool. Well, wow. Rick, I've got a, just a quick question. Sure. Is there much of an issue, and I don't think there is, but I, I read it, you may even brought it up, but you can hear it in the the original language can't see me. The original word can't see me. And I recently read there, and I should have written down a scripture, where one translation gives one meaning and another translation gives a second meaning. Mm hmm. And still, it flows through. Yeah. But it's, it's just, yeah, and it's and it's not a big issue. it's 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 an art. And again, I keep forgetting. I got I should repeat the questions. Um, but the um, question being about how um, a particular word in the original language may have two meanings, or may have sort of a multiple <clears throat> compound meaning, and that one translator may choose one word, one translator might choose another word. Uh, and that's, you know, in, in, again, in the Old Testament, it was really because the language was so pictorial, uh, sometimes you had to sort of read into it. And the example I gave was that, you know, the word for anger was nostril, you know. Um, and so certainly if you were talking about somebody's nostril, <laughs> you know, if you were a physician and talking about somebody's nostril, then you would use the same word that they use for anger, you know. So, you know, there can be dip, uh, double meanings. Uh, and, and in the Greek, sometimes the meaning just carries so much connotation that it's difficult to choose one single word. And that's why you might see in a New Living Translation or a New International, uh, you know, sort of a an explanation rather than a single word because there's so much connotation behind that word that uh, what, just putting one word there doesn't quite do it. But that's why, you know, the research is important, to putting a little bit of time into it. Um, so <clears throat> um, just not forgetting the interpretive principles that we've been talking about. Uh, don't get lost. You know, use the rules that we've talked about for language and for interpretation, for figures of speech and things like that to, to sort of keep you tethered um, and not, not getting off. You know, make sure your conclusions fit. If you, if you come to a conclusion that seems to contradict what you already know that the Bible says, then go back and read it again and, 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 and see if you can come to a a different conclusion. And, and it's not trying to mold the scripture to say what you want, but if you already know a particular truth, you know that the Bible is clear, 
you know, and using, using our, you know, our verse as an example, uh, Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, for by grace you are, you are saved, right? We, um, what was the, when we looked into the original language, it was we are having been saved, right? You know, we're saved by grace through faith. Now, if we look somewhere else in the scripture and it seems to indicate that we are saved by works, then we go back because we are, it's very clear, you know, we are, and again, one of the rules that we talked about was you always interpret a, a, an ambiguous verse in light of a clear verse. You don't, you don't say, well, this one, this one clearly says this. This one kind of sounds like it says the opposite. So I'm going to assume that the opposite is right and that this one is wrong. No. You say this one is clear. So this one is right and this one I have to reconsider and see if I can, you know, understand it in light of, of what I already know. So, you know, using the rules to keep you from getting lost uh, and bearing in mind, like we've already said, the Bible is meant to be understood. God gave it to us to understand. He doesn't, it's not a puzzle. It's not a mystery. It's not something he's trying to, you know, see if, you know, like a puzzle room or the escape room, see if we can trick him. God's not trying to trick us. He wants us to know what it says. Um, And most of it is easy to understand. Most of it is very straightforward. Uh, it, it has some depths that are difficult, uh, and some things we won't figure out. Some things are going to be left unanswered, you know, particularly prophecy. There's some prophecy in Revelation that we're just not meant to know. You know, we sort of have an understanding of what it might be saying or what it could be saying, you know, or a general understanding of what it's saying, but specifically, it's not for us to know. So, <clears throat> but now I want to get into... Um, what it takes to, to, to get down to the meaning. If, we're gonna, if we really want to get down to, now we know what it says, we, now we want to know what, what does it mean? What is the definition of it? Um, and and it, in order to do that, we have to draw some conclusions. We have to sit and, 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 and we're going we're gonna to do that tonight, if, if time will allow us to try to get to the end of this. So we can look at our verse and just try to start drawing some conclusions. Make some assumptions. Throw some things, you know, throw some stuff at it and see if it sticks. This is how we do it. You know, what, what does it sound like it's saying? Does that sound crazy or does that sound like it fits? Does that sound like it works? And, and, and getting into it a little bit and then discussing about, you know, it's like kind of like what we do at, in, at Home Fellowship. You know, we go over the passage that we've just had taught to us on Sunday. And the idea is to sort of dig up, dig it up a little bit. And let's talk about it. Let's, you know, let's, let's put some meat on the bones and, and, you know, walk it around the room. I'm using a lot of figurative language that I don't know, you know, uh, <clears throat> but just see, um, you know, see how everybody else hears it and how what everybody else is, is experiencing when they read it. Um, but there's some important things that you, you have to be spiritual. And let's just turn to John 6, 63. Gospel of John chapter 6, verse 63. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Um, In John 4, Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well. And she's talking about, oh, some worship on the mountain and some worship down here. And, And he said, God is a spirit. And if you worship him, you must worship him in what? In spirit and in truth. Right? We can't. Um, and then in uh, six, uh, First Corinthians, First Corinthians two, in verse fourteen, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You know, we guys like um, Lee Strobel and Josh McDowell, you know, their testimony is they didn't believe the Bible. They set out to prove it's wrong and they were converted in the process. They came to know the Lord. Now, 
that's certainly true. And, you know, certainly their hearts had to have been open to some degree. Uh, but they weren't studying the Bible. They were studying some of the facts of the Bible. Uh, and my point here is, is, you know, they weren't looking for deep truths. They were looking for historical information, you know, and then comparing it and then, and then um, seeing if what the Bible says is true and that kind of stuff. Um, when we're talking about reading the scripture for spiritual information, for doctrine, you can't be unsaved and, and get it. You know, you may be able to appreciate the language of it, uh, but, but you're not going to get at the heart of what it's saying because when we worship God, we have to worship him in spirit. If we're going to understand the word, we cannot understand it with a carnal mind. It has to be understood spiritually, and we have to be in the spirit. Um, in Job chapter 11... Verse 7, it says, Can you search out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol, what can you know? You know, the things of God are, are deeper than our carnal mind can, can understand. I can't um, worship God with my mind and my will and my emotions. Now, my mind and my will and my emotions have to be engaged. I have to be you know, doing it willingly. I have to be doing it intelligibly, you know, when I'm worshiping God and when I'm reading the scriptures, which is a form of worship. Uh, my emotions have to be engaged in it. They hopefully will be. But the tool that I'm using is my spirit because it is my spirit that, that communes with God's spirit. It's not my soul. It's not my flesh. It's not my mind. It is, it, it is my spirit that can commune with, with the spirit of God. Um, so we have the natural man. No spiritual connection at all. Did I not change this? Come on. Here we go. The natural man. No spiritual connection. Uh, possesses only what belongs to the soul. Psychological man, you could call him. You know? certainly is beyond just being a physical being, even though he may only believe that he's only a physical being. He certainly has a mind, a will, emotions. He has, there, there is an immaterial part to him, but no spiritual connection, unregenerate. And as we just read, incapable of really knowing God's word. He can repeat it. He can, under, he can, he can know the words and he can learn it. But as far as understanding the deep meaning behind it, it's just not possible. Then we have the carnal man. Now, this is, this is somebody who is saved, regenerate, uh, a possessor of the Holy Spirit, but they don't walk with the Spirit. They are in, in, in what I call practical atheists, walking according to the flesh. Okay, Somebody who has, has given their heart to Christ, but is living... In the world, like like what we just read in, in, in 1 John, love not the world, nor the things of the world, right? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. You know, believers live in that economy. There are believers that live in that economy that they just function like they're a natural man. And that is going to hinder their ability to understand the word of God. Because they have the spirit, but they're not submitted to him. They're not touching him. They're not ruled by him. And their understanding of, of Scripture is going to be limited. They may understand milk. They may, I may understand basic principles. You know, Jesus died for my sins. I'm a sinner. I need somebody to die for me. And that's, that's great. That's important information. But to go beyond that, is, it's, it's, they're capable of it, but they're not willing. They're, you know, they're limited in their understanding. Um, the spiritual man has the spirit, lives under his power, walks according to his principles. Ephesians 5.18, 
is being filled constantly with the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, over and over again, be filled, <clears throat> continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit um, and obedient to God's word, having a submitted heart. Now that, that makes us uh, available to really understand what God is trying to say. You know, one, one of the things that we have to do when we are trying to understand a, a passage of Scripture is, is after we've read it, after we've done the research, after we've done all our due diligence and writing things down, whatever, all the mechanical stuff, stop and meditate. We've, we've read the, the verse enough that we can probably do it in our head and just quietly ponder it, talk to God, read the verse to God, and just be quiet and see what God might say. You know, meditate on it. Um, and that's where God will begin to communicate, is, is in that time with him. And that's why our, when that is a regular thing, you know, the communication is a lot easier than, than if, it's, if, it's not so, if it's something that we don't do often. So we must be spiritual. We must be consecrated. Okay, what does that mean? Consecrated means set apart. Okay, 2 Corinthians 3.18. I'm going to read here. Um, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of God. It's, you know, it, consecrated means there's a purpose. Standing, like beholding ourselves in a mirror, you know, and being, being transformed. There is a purpose. There's an intention to it. Um, uh, the phrase I often use is, is be an intentional Christian, not an incidental Christian. Now, you know, don't be, oh, and, you know, I'm a Christian too. I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, and oh, yeah, I'm a believer of Jesus Christ too. You know, that should be at the top of the list of what I am and who I am, right? That, that, that is the thing, that's the filter that everything else in my life is passed through, is the fact that I'm a believer. And, and that's being... And an, an intentional Christian and consecration is, is, again, it means set apart. You know, the, uh, it's, it's like those dishes that your mother had in the hutch that, you know, when I grew up in an Italian family, she always had that expensive set of dishes that we never ate off of. You know, it was in the hutch and it was there and they were, you know, never to be touched. Sometimes when company came over, but the kids never got to eat off of it. It was special. It was for a particular purpose. And that's what we are. And God says, be consecrated, be set apart, be for a particular purpose. Um, our hearts must be open. We must be willing to receive it. You know, and that's uh, like I was talking about um, Lee Strobel and 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 Josh McDowell, I mean, to some degree, they had an openness. They had to have had an openness because God was able to reach them. But again, they were not studying the deep meaning and the truths in the scriptures. They were just studying the facts of the scriptures and the history of the scriptures and, and, and that uh, because that would have made no impact on them if they were just trying to study the doctrine of, uh, you know, you know, uh, reading Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, and understanding what it means to be saved by grace. That's not what they were looking at. They were just looking at the historical documents and things like that. Um, but being unsaved, not being consecrated and set apart and filled with the Holy Spirit, these things can't be clear to us. Um, God's light only shines on those who are open to him. We have to place ourselves in a place where we are receiving God's truth, preparing ourselves, setting ourselves apart. Yes, sure. If the word is powerful, besides the other word, the Christ and shelter the Lord and all of that, <clears throat> just by putting yourself in that space, 
can that give the word a chance to grow? Yeah, now the word, yeah, let, let, me, let me clarify that. Um, the word is certainly powerful enough to reach somebody who was unsaved who, or who was carnal. If, if they're willing to, now they may not understand the depths of it, but it can certainly impact their life. Pastor Bill is a perfect example. He talks about how the thing that got him was reading Jesus saying, love your enemies, do good to those that spitefully use you, bless those that persecute you. And now he didn't understand necessarily the depth of understanding of what that means, he just said, that's nuts. <laughs> People don't say that. Only God would say that. Now, he had, you know, Bill was not an atheist. He actually probably thought he was a believer, <laughs> you know, growing up in a, in a, in a Presbyterian and a, and a uh, Methodist church. And I thought I was a believer growing up in the Catholic church, and um, but not understanding the gospel uh, but when he read that, he said, people don't say that. Only God would say that. And that, and that revealed to him that Jesus was God, which was something he had not learned in 38 years of being in, in, a, in a denominational church. So yeah, the, the Bible can uh, certainly have an impact. Uh, I'm another example of being a carnal Christian. I had gotten saved, but had really just gone back in the world. You know, I tell people I got saved for the fire insurance. I got saved and then I actually got worse um, and went back in the world. And uh, But then I began to think about the decision that I made and, and decided I would start reading the Bible. And my attitude, honestly, was... I, because I had time to kill. I was riding in a train from, from uh, where I lived in Stoneham, Massachusetts to, to Boston. And there was a train that I would have to take every morning to go to college. And it was about a 20 minute train ride and I had nothing to do for those 20 minutes. I said, well, what could it hurt? I'll read the Bible. I don't want to read my textbooks. I, I'm reading that day and night and I don't want to read my text. I'm going to read the Bible. What could it hurt? And as a carnal Christian reading the scriptures, God got a hold of me, you know, even in my carnal condition. Uh, but it took some time softening me up. And, and, and again, like, like with Bill, reading things and going, wow, who says that? You know, and then, and then being made to open up, to receive it. You know, but it took a while for a lot of these things to really make sense until until I really began to understand how to be in the spirit. You know, so so certainly the word of God can, you know, can make an impact in people's lives. But I have another question. Sure. Um, I heard Bodie Bachman say one time that the sinner's prayer will send more people to hell than because it's just, you know, they've just said it as words and then they think like you said, fire insurance. Mm -hmm. So th that's confusing to me, the carnal part. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I guess I don't quite understand it because if, do you know what I'm trying to say? Like, um, you know, someone said, okay, now I'm safe. I can go live however I can right. do whatever I want, but there's right. no change. Right. So if, if conversion is turning around in a change, mm -hmm. then is that really conversion? But but it's a false sense. Mm -hmm. Well, and here's the thing. I, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of that phrase. I've heard people say that before. Uh, I don't know Vody Bachman real well. I've heard um, some, but I understand what that is meant to say, that the sinner's prayer is send more people to hell. I don't, I don't think it's factually correct mm -hmm. to say that the yeah. sinner's prayer has sent more people to hell than anything else. I, I think I think the impact is that yeah don't be and I my, what I say is don't tell me you're going to heaven just because you said a prayer at a Billy Graham crusade, you know that because you said some little prayer Jesus come into my heart and live and be my Lord and Savior blah 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 blah, you know um, let me see, you know like what James says, let me see something in your life. If I see nothing in your life, I have no reason to believe that you're saved. 
Yeah, but, right. By, by, the, by your fruit, you shall know them. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, I think the idea of the sinner's prayer, and like Bill always says, it's not the prayer that saves you. It's the attitude of your heart. The prayer, and there is, there's a movement. I don't know if Vody Bachman is part of it. There's another guy I know that's part of this movement that says we should not lead people to salvation. We should just preach the word and basically say goodnight and let the Holy Spirit lead them to come up and ask us, what must I do to be saved? Uh, and that's fine. I mean, that's what the, the Philippian jailer did, right? What must I do to be saved? And um, the, the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, but I don't think there's anything wrong with leading, giving people an opportunity who have never heard it before to do it. Um, <clears throat> but, but you're right. That doesn't mean that you're saved. Now, I know that I was saved because I know the sincerity of my heart and I know, the, I know what happened to me the night that I received Christ, but because I, I didn't stick with it and I didn't have any teaching, I just, the, the enemy got a hold of me and was trying to squelch it. Now, God is the hound of heaven. God's not gonna, you know, God, uh, you know, I, like the Billy Graham song goes, just as I am. God accepts me just as I am, but he's not content to leave me there. You know, and he loves me too much to leave me there. So he will always try to reach out to me. Now, had I not truly been saved, then I probably never would have picked up my Bible and said, you know, what the heck? Let me, you know what I mean? There was something that was, and it was the Holy Spirit within me that was, that was drawing me to to the scriptures. So if somebody is saved, I believe that God is going to reach out to them. Now, some people may be saved and may live their life in carnality because they're just not, they're, they're rebellious enough to not want to be taught and not want to submit themselves to God. And um, the Bible talks about them suffering loss of all rewards. And the Bible even talks about taking them home early. You know, uh, you know, there is a sin that leads unto death. And Paul said there, you know, people who commit these types of sins, he says, some are sick and some sleep, you know. Um, and I don't want to get into a whole, that's not really what we're doing here tonight. But, but the, the point being, can you be carnal and be saved? To a degree, yes. I think if, you, if, if you're just, if you're living a carnal life, you can't know you're saved. And you, you in, 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 in all likelihood, may not be saved. <laughs> so, you know, don't, don't hang on to a prayer as your, well, no, I said this prayer, you know. Um, as I've heard people say, no, no, he, he went forward. He, say, he said a prayer. Yeah, look at his life. He denies Christ. You can't say that a guy who deny, it was currently denying Christ as Lord is saved because he said a prayer 20 years ago. You know, so yes and no. <laughs> not, not trying to equivocate, but sometimes, you know, things are not as, as cut and dry as we'd like them to be. Um, but generally, but generally speaking, you know, to, to really get, because bear in mind, what are we doing here? This is hermeneutics. And, you know, this is, we're trying to go a little deeper. And to get that depth, to really get at the, the, the meaning behind what is written, it, it, takes, it takes the Holy Spirit, you know? An unsaved person can read, by grace you are saved. It is not of ourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, right? And can read that and, and say, yeah, I, I understand what it's saying. It's saying you're not saved by works, you're saved by grace. But can they really get it? Do they, can they appreciate it? You know, does it, you know, is it something that, can choke them up when they read it? Is it something that imp impacts them in their, in their soul and in their, in their spirit and in their heart um, when they read it? Does, does the meaning of it mean something to them or is it just information? You know, and I think that you know, certainly God can reach out to the unsaved as they're reading the scripture and, and make himself, reveal himself to them. I think the deep things of God are, un are understood by his spirit and they're understood 
by us, only by our spirit. So, um, so our eye must be single. Matthew six twenty two. Jesus said, "Let your eye be single." And that word "single" literally means unfolded, uncomplicated, simple. You know, unfettered, focused. The eye is the lamp of the body. Um, the lamp is not the light. The light comes from God. The lamp is where we obtain it. You know, the, if the eye is a single is single, then the body is full of light, is what it says. So it. You know, we have to be focused. When I am consecrated, when I'm reading the scripture, you know, and there are times we can, if we're just feeling like we just want to read and just kind of read through and that's, and that's fine, but it should be a sacred time. Whether I'm just sort of doing a panoramic reading, like we talked about where I'm reading a large section, maybe I'm reading chapters in first and second Samuel. You know, just getting the getting the story down as I'm going through it. Uh, or if I'm taking time and studying and, and digging out the Greek and the Hebrew, regardless, it needs to be a sacred time, a time that we set aside and that maybe we don't, you know, don't have the background noise going, don't have the music going or whatever, going out, finding a nice quiet place and say, this is my time to spend with God and God's word. And let it be so that I can be focused on, on what I'm hearing. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's about having priorities and it's about obedience. You know, our level of obedience will determine our level of light. You know, it, the, the world says, if I can understand it, I'll believe it. But God says, believe it and then you'll understand it. You won't completely understand it until you believe it. Take the step of faith, put your faith in me, believe in me, and then you will begin to understand what it means. Yeah, and that, and that, and that takes obedience to take that step of faith to go out and trust that. And, and the more that we are obedient and willing, then the more we'll know, the more he can open up to us, you know, uh, God's word becomes, uh, clearer as we walk with him, you know, uh, practical application brings illumination. Um, the last thing is be exercised. And what does that mean? It means it, it, basically what I just said, be active, be involved, be you know, be proactive about your faith. Hebrews 5.14. I'll just turn there real quick to read it. But solid food belongs to those who are full of age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You know, it's, it's like anything else. If you use something, you, you are better at it. The more you do something, the more skilled you are at it. The more you spend time trying to understand the word of God, the more you will understand it. You know, if we're just popping in once in a while, we'll get stuff, but we'll get more if we're popping in on a regular basis. And, you know, and we start out with milk. This is what the scripture says. We start out with milk. We have to move to whole food, but you can't just jump right into whole food until you're accustomed to it. You know, it takes, it takes time. It takes practice. It takes being trained and skillful. And, and, uh, and I don't even mean trained in Bible college or anything like that. I just mean just by doing it and allowing the Holy Spirit to, to train us, to, um, to be involved, just like everybody here is doing. You're coming out to a class, you know. Uh, there's a lot of people that this something like this would not interest them, uh, or a home fellowship might not interest them, or coming on a Wednesday night might not interest them. They're happy just coming out come Sunday morning. That's it. That's, I'll punch my clock, and and that's and that's fine with them. But those that want a little more will seek a little more. 
you know, and the more you're involved, the more you're part of it, the more you'll be able to receive. Um, and lastly, just be aware of pitfalls. Um, don't be subjective. Don't be, yeah, here we go. Don't be filled with your own thoughts. Don't think, don't assume you know what something means or don't interpret something in, in, in a way that, that serves your particular um, mindset. Uh, it, it drives me crazy when I see politicians reading from scripture who there's no way that they're believers. And I'm not trying to judge them, but, but I mean, people who they're just trying to use a scripture to defend their particular and they're completely misrepresenting it, you know, and it's <laughs> perfect examples when, you know, when the towers fell and they, and they got up and they read that verse about, you know, uh, we will rebuild and we, you know, we will, they, um, I can't even remember the verse now, but it was like, you have built with this and we'll build it with cedar and you have done that. And, you know, and it was like trying to say, we're going to rebuild better than it was. And that passage in the scripture that says that was men shaking their fist at God and mocking God, yeah. you know, and saying, yeah, we're going to rebuild it, God. We're going to, and it was, a, it was, they were arrogant, proud boasters and they were reading it like oh isn't this a great hopeful thing to say and they because they just it served their purpose and we can get subjective we can we can read a verse and we think we know what it should say uh but don't be so sure don't don't read the verse you know subjective means reading it through my lens i'm the subject right so i read when i read something subjectively i'm sorry uh, when I, Isaiah 9, verses 10 and 11. What's that? The bricks are falling down. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right, right. <clears throat> um, I can see this Hebrews 5, verses 13 and 14. Mm -hmm. There was a famine or something. The politician said, but solid food belongs to the only yeah. people that fall away. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so only feed the old people. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, but, you know, don't, don't view the scripture through your lens. Try to view it through his lens. Um, and don't be careless. Um, you know, the Bible is, is a very accurate book, right down to the very word. Don't skip things out. Don't jump over things that need to be addressed. Uh, you know, you'll miss things again. Just going into it with presumptions, assuming you think you know what it's saying. I'm just trying to think of the, Bill had given an example of what, you know, people think that this verse says this, but it doesn't say that at all. Um, <clears throat> trying to think what it was now. Uh, don't be curious or don't be over curious is really what, what you don't want to be is, you know, don't look for strange things. You know, and this is this is where you see a lot of these guys on TV. They find something and they get, you know, they they find uh, some minor mention, and they'll go off on some doctrine and and build and write books on a particular thing, and and uh, and it's really a minor thing in the Bible. Um, you know, I a guy who. Tried to, was trying to prove that the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden was actually a vine. You know, what's the point? Is there a point to why, whether it's a vine or a tree? It says tree, so I'm going to assume it's a tree. Well, could it have been a vine? Okay, maybe it could have been a vine. Who cares? You know, I just wasted 10 seconds talking about it, you know. Uh, or, and like we said before, an inordinate study of prophecy and numerology and things like that. Uh, you know, I think we need to study those things. We need to have an understanding. But if you go on and on with with minor things, um, being too being overly curious, you can get yourself um, into trouble. So uh, let's do this. I think that's my last verse. <clears throat> let's go to our verse. Okay, and 
let's just talk about meaning now. Not just not looking at the 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 words, the definition of the words, and we've we've sort of been through that a little bit, okay? And let's just we'll even just take up to here. Okay. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Okay, now we understand what it says. We understand the words. Okay, it's saying that salvation is, is by grace through faith. Okay, but let's talk about what, what that means. I mean, what are you hearing beyond just the words here? Okay, the faith comes first. Okay. But and 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 it does and and who's let's look at the 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 things that are being done here, okay? We we're being saved. Okay? Um who's doing the saving? God is doing the saving, right? So the by grace you have been saved is God's part. Okay, um, and the faith is our part. Not that, and again, not saying that that is a work. And I only, and you're right, it, in, this, in this context, the faith comes first. Now, you know, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So the, you know, the actual divine romance is that he initiates to us reveals himself to us, then we respond by faith and then he saves. But, but you're right, as far as that, that, that the process that we have here, uh, that it begins with faith. It you begins... Have, you have to go deeper on the word faith? I mean, okay, okay. I go ahead. There's a God. Okay. That's not faith in my mind. Okay. So... Go ahead. Just, just that word faith is a lot deeper than... Probably when I was Catholic. Yeah. Okay. Well, what do you what do you think it's saying? It's and again, this is what we're, I want to do. I just want to get discussion yeah. flowing, and because because you're right, but but what is so? What does it mean? If it doesn't mean just a mental assent, then what does it mean? It means belief, a belief that you live, trust. I heard what I thought was a great definition, a simple definition. Taking God at His word. Yeah. Believing God at His word. Live. Trust. A verse that caught me on faith, I've always battled with. Am I, do I have enough faith? Am I faithful? Am I, mm -hmm. Is the, uh, when uh, Jesus said, Happy is he that sees and believes, mm -hmm. but blessed is he that does not see and has faith. Yeah. And that really hit me in the face, that one. I, I, I say that to myself a lot, you know, and uh, faith is a, it's not something where you go to a, you know, you're going to jump off a cliff because you believe God's going to save you, you know, but you know that He's going to tell you not to do a thing. Yeah. You know, don't jump. Yeah. Because I'm not going to save you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we can't think of faith as something that we have to work up. I got to believe. I got to believe. I got to believe. Faith is much more restful <laughs> than that. Because um, if it's living it, I mean, it's, it's, it's living, loving your loving God and loving your neighbor and, and loving it. I, I heard a quote from, I think, Nietzsche, or I don't know how you pronounce it, but he said, um, these Christians need to show me they are redeemed before oh, yeah. I believe in their redeemer. Yeah, yeah. Nietzsche, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And it, it, that, to me, that is, what you're talking about is, is like the fruit of faith. It's the, the genuineness 
of faith. But somebody said trust. Who said trust? <clears throat> the word that always comes in my mind and trust is, is, and this is again, this is where, you know, look, you might want to look the word trust up in the dictionary, in an English dictionary. Because, it you know, we throw the word trust out there and we think we know what it means. And, and it means that, but it can mean, you know, flavors of other things. The phrase I always think of is rely on. Okay, and my example is always a chair, you know, because somebody my size, I don't trust every chair. <laughs> there was, some, right, Jeff? <laughs> you know, those, remember those little summer picnic aluminum tube chairs? I, I don't go near those chairs. Okay, I've, I've been let down. I don't trust them. Okay, I don't, but you know, a chair, what's that? What does let down mean? Yeah, exactly. Um, and, but a chair that I've been in, a chair that I can look at, and I think we, or, oh, they're out in the, they're out there. We've got chairs out in the, um, in the courtyard. And it's those chairs, you know, they sort of, they, they look like this, you know? They've got no back leg. They just have a, a bend. And then we've got some out there. And we used to have, they used to be in here. I never sat on them. <laughs> I, that thing's got no back. It's just I, everything is relying on that little spot and that bend, you know. Um, so I can look at something and say, I'm not trusting that. Um, but I can also look at a chair, you know, barrel chair like that, or these chairs are certainly, and say, I can trust them, you know, and partly because I've been on them and I put my trust in them and I know they're not going to let me down. And I, you know, and so there's something restful about that. You know, when I would sit, I've sat in those chairs and I wasn't restful. And I, I sort of believe that they're built right and they will hold me, but I was never restful in them, <laughs> you know, and there's something restful about faith that I don't have to worry. It's, I can trust, I can rely on, I can relax. I don't have to work it up. I don't have to, do I believe? I got to believe better. I got to believe. That's works. You know, faith is just letting go, you know? So that's, you know, that's a great point of looking at, looking at a verse like this and just focus on that word. And we're not even really doing, I didn't talk about pistuo and, you know, getting into the Greek, but just, just what we call faith. What does that mean? What is it, you know, because we all sort of understand that it doesn't mean mental assent, you know, like those chairs out there. I believe that they exist. I don't doubt their existence at all. I'm completely confident that they're there, but I'm not putting my faith in them. Jim? Um, well, the verse said, uh, turn me toward God was Hebrews 11.6, and it says without faith it is impossible to please him. Yep. Please him became very, very important in my heart. Yeah. And, and not only became important, it was scary. Okay? Because I knew that if I didn't please God, I wouldn't trouble. Yeah. So I don't know <clears throat> what kind of terminology you might put on that kind of faith um, or description of that faith, but pleasing God. Well, think, think of it that it is the only thing that pleases God, yes. right? It's the only thing that pleases God. It's the only thing that I can offer God that pleases him. I can't offer him my money. And now if there's faith attached to my gift, that pleases him. But if there's no faith attached to it, it doesn't please him at all, right? I can't offer him my skills, my talents, my gifts, my whatever, unless there's faith. It's the only thing that, that pleases him. And faith being trust, reliance, letting go. You know, the one thing that God will never do is violate my free will, right? And it's the one thing he wants from us, to surrender our will. That's, an, that's what an act of faith is. I surrender, you know, when I go to sit on that chair, I'm surrendering myself to the will of that chair. 
and I'm surrendering my will. And then when I surrender my will to God and say, whatever you, whatever your plan is, whatever your will is, I surrender to it. That's, it pleases God because it's, because it's an act of faith. Right now, was there, did you have your hand up? No. Okay. I, thought I saw your hand up and want to miss you. Oh, okay. That's all right. Paul. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's the source of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what he just said about pleasing God really struck a deal with me just now. I, uh, you know, you, you try to walk in Christ's path. You know, you do as much as you can. You always fall short. I know all that. Uh, but like driving here, this guy cut me off. And I sounded like a drunken sailor. And then I said to myself, well, I didn't really sin because nobody hurt me. And then I said to myself. The tree falls in the forest, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But then I said, except you, Lord. Yeah. And, and I thought, hmm. And he's the one who's like, Well, and what did David say? Against you alone. I didn't even talk about the sin of having an affair with Bathsheba and then killing her husband. And he turns and says, against you alone have I sinned yeah. to God, right? So what else do we get out of this? Let's just look at the next section. <clears throat> and that not of yourselves. And we talked a little bit about that with somebody. Oh, Tracy, go ahead. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a great example of looking into something that's not in the verse, okay? Right? We have saved, that's in the verse. Say We can say that saved means delivered, okay, right? But here's what's not in the verse. From what? <laughs> right? It doesn't say what we're saved from, but we can think about it. We can ponder it when we read that. I've been saved. From, saved from what? And we begin to think about what we have been saved from, what he has delivered us from, what we were in peril of, and, and it, it, will, it, it will bring things out of this verse on a personal level that isn't there just in the actual words, right? So as we, you know, we can sort of get deeper into the meaning. So looking at, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And again, not even necessarily looking at what it says, so trying to define it, but what does it mean? How, you know, how, how could we paraphrase that? Or, you know, what is, it, what is it not saying? Or, what, you know, what's not in there that we can glean out of it? Yep. Sure. Okay.
Sure. And I was thinking just a couple of weeks ago how if a certain person would love to come down and spend a week with me and, you know, get by as inexpensively as possible, and I just don't have the desire to spend the time with her. And I think about that in our filthy rags of um, trying to combine our works or our gifts with God's grace. Yeah. Yep. But if you're going to try and, and add to it some tiny little measure of your works or your gift to it, that completely, and then you would never go back home and yeah. say, oh, well, I chip in when I'm down there. Yeah. Or I don't go for free. It, it, sours, then, it sours the gift a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah. And it just seems like it makes me realize the magnitude of what God is giving us that we should try and add however much. Say that we've added something to what he's given us. Yeah, yeah. And you know, when you were talking, what occurred to me was, and this is this is almost on, on the, the other side of it, the sad side of it is, are there those who would say, no, I won't go because I can't contribute. So I just, I'll, I just won't go. Yeah. And how many people would feel like, I can't, and I had a guy tell me this one time. He says, I can't, I tried to invite him to, to pray. He believed everything that I said. And I tried to invite him to pray with me and he wouldn't because he says, I just don't feel like I'm worthy. And, you know, that sort of sounds humble and it is, I think in his heart, he was humble. But I was trying to explain to him, you're not. <laughs> You're not supposed to be worthy. You're not supposed because he's thinking I've I've got to I got to bring something to the table. I have to be able to I won't I won't go unless I can bring something, and I can't bring anything so I won't go, and and you know so that you know that passage can mean that to a lot of people that they'll miss out because God is telling them look I don't want anything of yours. It does me. Yeah. Uh, I don't go to men's. <laughs> we go to men's Bible study because uh, when I have, if I say something, I get contradicted, or you know, and I pretty soon I feel like I'm always saying the wrong thing. So then I just stop saying anything, mm. and then finally I just stop going. Yeah. Well, and it's unfortunate. Yeah. I don't want to, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it's unfortunate. I mean, sometimes it's just the nature of you get a room full of people and people are going to say stuff and people are going to say, no, I don't think that's that way at all, you know, yeah. and, you know, I think, I think people, if they're going to disagree, they should do it nicely, but, you know, well, and, they and usually do, it's just that then I think about it later and I think, well, that was a stupid thing to say, <laughs> you know. No, I know why I was a fireman. You know, certain people become fireman. You just always put out fires. You know, they run into buildings that are running out. So I don't know. It's, it's just gives me a funny feeling. That's why, well, you know, I'm but like, sometimes it's sometimes it's about receiving. Yeah. So. <laughs> yep. Of course, this uh, this section we're looking at here is just completely against our day to day normal. Sure. is the most important thing. Our, I don't want to get it. I want to earn it. Yeah. You know? And, and so this is difficult to grasp at the very beginning. And after I've learned enough, so yeah, I, I think it's fantastic. But yep. it's difficult at the beginning. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, that's why it's an important verse, because it goes against 
again, the, the presuppositions that we have to earn our way, that we have to, you know, we have to be good enough. We have to offer God something on some level, uh, right? I think of it like my father, you know, that uh, he loved me. And I didn't have to do anything for him to love me. Right. I mean, you know, stay out of trouble and all But I didn't have to, you know, pay a pence. I didn't have to do anything. It was more he genuinely loved me. Like, yeah. Here. Right. There was nothing you had to offer him to. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it stands in the way. All right, let's just look at this real quick and then we'll and then we'll close. Okay? For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. We'll just go that far. <clears throat> okay? Anything standing out or anything that Who me? Being his workmanship? Yeah. You've got to be kidding. <laughs> Well, let's look at let's look at this four, and that's an important. Again, you know, we talked about sometimes don't don't dismiss the small words, the prepositions and the little words. Four, because, right, we are we have been saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves; it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should should boast. Because we are His workmanship. You know, if we think about tying it in, right, that it's not just a separate verse. It's not just an independent thought. It's, it's, it's tied in with what he's saying, that being saved by grace through faith, not of works, not of ourselves, we can't boast because we are whose workmanship? I'm not my workmanship. Right? And we talked about workmanship is that word poema, uh, which means like an opus, a great uh, a work of art, if you will. <clears throat> um, so anything, anything else from that? I have a friend who always says she's not worthy, that she can't do enough. And I think it goes back to what you said. I mean, Believe it, and then you'll understand. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, and that's, well, and that's, yeah, we look about that. Look at that. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Almost sounds like it's contradicting everything we just read. <laughs> Right. <clears throat> but it's 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 just being practical. And it's it's you know, it's like you were saying, well, faith means living it out. You know, it's in your works. It's in your you know, we can't get caught up. Sometimes we get caught up in hearing works. No, nah, works is bad. No, works is not bad. Works are good <laughs> and good works are really good. Uh, it, they just don't save us, but they're they're a great example of the work that 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 God has done, and that's I think you know that's what we can say is this this workmanship, okay? It's His work. It's like the that pot of clay uh, in Jeremiah, right? What say does He have? What say does the pot of clay have in what He's going to become? None. It's, you know, he is the workmanship of the potter and, and we're his workmanship created in Christ for good works, for sanctification, like Paul said, for being set aside. That's, you know, holiness. We think of, we think of the term holy. When we read in the Bible, we think of holy, we think of being good, right? Holiness, being good. Uh, and it does mean that, but it means set apart. It's the same word, hagios, sanctification, Set apart, special. Tracy? I was also thinking about how we've been given the Bible um, and I think it was Karen who used the Bible. I'm 
going to say verify, but of course, it's, that's not the right word. The Bible verifies that Paul. Yep. Like, um, and, and here we have Paul talking about, um, you know, we're created in Christ Jesus for good works, and then James talks about it as well, and how, you know, you have true people and apostles, but they're all giving you the same message. You know, James says, you know, show me your faith. You know, well, yeah, and, and, and they confirm that you have faith and, and things like that. So, you, like I said, you have two different apostles saying, yeah, confirming the same thing. And sometimes it's, it's just, it's two sides of the same coin. They seem like they're contradicting each other, but rather than being contradictory, they're complementary. You know, they're the other piece of the puzzle. You know, uh, Paul emphasized, you know, grace and, and not, not needing works for salvation. And, and James was just saying, yeah, but... If you are saved, you know, there should be, <laughs> there should be some evidence of it. There, it, it you know, you, cause he didn't make you for sin. He didn't, he's not, you're not his workmanship so that you can continue sinning or that you can, you know, not do anything. He, he, you know, he's working on you. You are his workmanship. You're his work of art so that you can honor him so that you can be useful for him. Right. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and what what <clears throat> What was it we just, uh, trying to find it now, that uh, Bill, just, uh, Bill just read in, in 1 John. Uh, well, when he was talking about, you know, hating your brother, you know, or, or you know, if, if somebody comes to you in need and you have it, right? So the, you know, the, the, the scripture is there to say, yeah, you should be doing these things. It's not, but it's not earning your salvation. It's just a demonstration. You know, what does he say? This is how we can know we pass from death unto life because we love the brethren, right? It's the, it's the outworking of it. So, all right. So next week we're going to talk, we're going to get into application, uh, which is ultimately, <clears throat> it's the point, you know, it's really the point of, of why we're, we're studying the scripture is what do we do with it? We need to do something with it, you know, and it is, um, interestingly, the one thing that is not a, an emphasis in expositional teaching, you know, what, what we do here, we teach the Bible. We're going to tell you, you know, what it says. We're going to tell you what it means. But the Holy Spirit has to tell you what it means for you. I can't tell you what it means for you. There's no way that I can communicate, you know, even in just this room of 20 or 25 people. This, this verse means 25 different things. To, to you personally. And so it's, and this is, and this is where a lot of churches, they want to teach application. They teach all application. You know, here's what you do with this. Here's what you do with this. Here's what you do. Um, we'd rather just, here's what it says. Here's what it means. What you do with it is between you and God. Because if I tell you what to do and you go out and do it, that's great. But then I have to keep telling you because you won't keep doing it, you know? It's like people who <clears throat> sometimes they, they stop coming to church, they stray, they get a little <clears throat> lackadaisical. We can call them. Bill and I could call them and say, hey, we miss you. I want you to come back. I haven't seen you in a while. hope everything's okay. And they'll probably come back next week. And in a couple of weeks, they'll be gone again. 
and it's going to take me or Bill calling them again. Hey, how you been? Haven't seen you in a while. Would love to have you come back. And then they'll come back for a couple of weeks and then they'll be gone. And then it's like, well, that's a hamster wheel. And not, not on our part, but all, they're coming because I'm saying for them to come. Maybe I made them feel guilty. Maybe it was conviction, but I want them to come back because the Holy Spirit said, get back. <laughs> then they'll stay, right? So application is vital for us when we're reading the scripture for us to, to make it personal and, to, and to, to see what is God, not just what is God saying and what does he mean, but what does, he, what does it mean to me? And how does it work in my relationship with God? So that's what we're going to talk about next week. And, uh, <clears throat> and we'll finish up the verse. Do my little eraser thing. And then we'll, um, on the last class, we're, gonna, we're just going to talk about some tools that you can use. And, you know, we've, you don't have to be a Bible college student in, a, in, in that sense. You don't have to be, have a library full of stuff. A couple of good tools, and we've got a handful of them in this bookstore that, that you can avail yourself of. Uh, and then there's some great ones that you can get online. Some you can pay for, some are free. Uh, all depends on how, how deep you want to go.